Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this source event. Um, this is the first of our kind of official scheduled source events after our launch event, which took place last week. Um, source is a series of online research software events. It's an international group that's uh, set this up. Um, and for those of you who just were, were, were on the call a couple of minutes ago and saw our welcome, you can see there's lots of people from um, a range of different uh, national, international RSE groups that are um, that are behind the source uh, series. Um, today we we have a, um, a talk on executable research article um, from Emmy Sang, and she's going to going to present with uh, her collaborator Alex. Um, and I will give them an introduction in a moment. But before I do that, I will just uh, highlight um, the, the the setup for today's event. So. Um, there's going to be a talk and a demo, so there'll be a few slides, but main, the main part of this will be a software demo. Um, so uh, that will be around about 35 minutes or so, and then there'll be some time for questions afterwards. Um, and then following that, um, there will be time for general discussion and Q&A. Um, it's uh, very much up to you if you, if you obviously, I know many people will need to leave um, on the hour just before, but if you do want to stay on afterwards, then uh, we will continue afterwards and that's not a problem um so there, there will be the option to stay on longer if you want to and um the, the i just highlight also the source code of conduct um there's a link there to the code of conduct um and that's the, the code of conduct we, we expect everyone involved in uh, source of events to adhere to that so i just want to highlight that to you um okay so um i'm going to now just highlight also the upcoming events um, so we've got a, a really a really strong series of, of talks coming up over the next few weeks um, you can see there there's pretty much every week certainly for the next uh, four weeks we've got talks scheduled and the, the schedule does actually run uh, beyond the 16th of October there um, we've got several more uh, sessions coming up over the next uh, over the next couple of months so do keep an eye out for that um, there's a link at the top for the program and um, I hope you'll be able to attend some more of the the events uh, over the coming uh, over the coming months. And so, with that, um, I'm very pleased to um, to welcome Emmy and Alex, who are going to present um, their their talk and demo on executable research article enriching a research paper with code and data. And I will um, uh, turn off my screen share and I will hand over to Emmy. Thank you, Jeremy, for the introduction. I'm uh, just going to take a moment to share my screen here. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on this talk today. Um, so uh, my name is Emmy. I'm the Innovation Community Manager at eLife. And today, I'm very happy to be joined by Alex, who is a designer and software engineer at Stencilla. So today's focus, we're hoping to share um, a very exciting project that uh, eLife, in collaboration with Stencilla, has been working on for uh, over three years now, I think. Um, and uh, so we're, we're very happy to share sort of our latest progress. And um, we think that this, you know, is, is an interesting uh, software uh, stack of tools that uh, will be of interest to the research software engineering community. So um, just a brief intro introduction into eLife for those of you who are not uh, familiar. So we are a nonprofit organization with the mission to um, promote and encourage the responsible behaviors in research. So we're probably best known for publishing a fully online open access uh, journal in the uh, life science research area. But we actually do um, quite a lot more beyond uh, running a journal. So uh, part of the, the, the other work that we do um, is uh, the eLife Innovation Initiative. So um, with, the, with this initiative, we're aiming to provide funding, training, community support for creative individuals, innovators, and teams within the academic and technology uh, industries. And the primary outputs of this initiative are open source solutions aimed at improving the discovery, sharing, consumption, and evaluation of research. So the executable research article project, as I mentioned, we've been working on for <laughs> since 2017. Um, it used to be known as the Reproducible Document Stack Project, quite a mouthful, so we changed the name. <laughs> um, but uh, so the motivation for this work is 
that we realize that while code and data are increasingly important in research, they're often left out of the main narrative of a research paper. And that really negatively impacts the reproducibility and reusability of the research that's published. So if, you know, um, if any of you have tried to reproduce um, analysis within a paper that was published, uh, I think you can agree with me that that's not a very easy thing to do, even with the provided GitHub repository and everything. So um, our vision uh, is this executable research article is one that encapsulates usable code and data within the flow of a manuscript. Um, we hope that the tools we develop will develop, deliver uh, progressive enhancement, which means um, if you are, you know, browsing a paper and trying to understand where you, uh, whether you want to read further, you'll be, you'll be shown sort of a more static um, research article. Whereas if you do want to interact with the data and code further, there is this possibility that you can do that um, online within the browser. Um, the tools that we develop should be future proof. So platform to and language agnostic should be easy and accessible for everyone. And then ultimately we hope to encourage the reuse of published research. So, um, I think the easiest to show you what we mean by all of this is to basically show you what an era or the executable, executable research article looks like because we've already launched the project. So now it's sort of like the vision has been kind of realized. So I can show you how it looks. So um, this is all live and online. So you're seeing my browser. Um, uh, so this uh, article looks like any other article that uh, you would see on the eLife website, except when you scroll down um, you see some of these figures. So for example, the two bar plots here, there's this little eye, blue icon on the top left. So we click on that, you see the uh, code that actually generates these two bar plots. What you can also do is, um, so I can edit some of this code in the browser. So this is R. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with R, you'll realize that I'm actually trying to change this plot into a dot plot. So when I click run here, you see that change manifesting almost immediately within the browser itself. So um, uh, that's our vision. Um, and we've, we've actually demonstrated this vision with a demo, I think last year in February. And since that demo was published, we've received a lot of positive feedback and folks coming to us and asking whether or not they could uh, already published their articles in this format with us. Um, and we realized that in order to do that, we need to build a stack of tools, tools that will allow researchers to author their manuscripts with uh, code and data embedded, tools that will allow us to host these articles and set up the reproducible execution environments that are needed for, to allow the life re-execution, and uh, tools for us and any other publishers who are interested to be able to accept and publish these executable research articles at scale. While we're moving towards this vision, we strive to develop ERA in accordance with these three core principles. We commit to working in the open. We're not trying to win any sort of tools race and we aim to maximize our reuse of existing open technologies wherever applicable. All of our tools are um, created openly. Um, the code base is on GitHub. Um, we aim to communicate and update the community on our developmental progress and time and milestones and actively collect feedback and foster collaboration, which is exactly what we're doing now at, at, this, at this event. Um, we're also, we also understand that research and tech ecosystems evolve very quickly. So it's really important that the tools are interoperable and future-proof so that the infrastructure can be efficiently maintained and users don't have to constantly switch and learn to use new tools. And then finally, by building um, in the open and keeping our tools modular, we hope that other innovators um, and software engineers in the community, for example, can build on top of our technological innovations. So, um, the the way that I'm the demo sort of works. Um, I think um, uh, what I'm going to do is to show everyone here how uh, an author, so a researcher, could author uh, an a um, executable research article. 
Um, and then Alex will go on to show some of the sort of innovations and how potentially folks who are interested can build on top of that, which I think is really exciting. So, um, but yeah, this is, this is, this part, this first part will, will be focused on sort of as a researcher, I've got a manuscript and it has a huge code component or it has some code component to it. How do I build that, that executable version that I've seen, that you've seen uh, me demonstrating before? So uh, the workflow uh, is quite simple. So at the moment, um, this is, I should say, this is at the moment limited to eLife authors who published with us. The idea is that the uh, era is a complement to their already published research. Um, we do hope to move towards the stage where we'd be able to accept submissions um, directly let's say from Jupyter or from R Markdown or an era, era compatible format, um, but that hasn't happened yet, but it's definitely something that we want to do in the future. So right now we're talking about uh, folks who has uh, an article published on eLife and uh, would like to build an era as a complement to their published article. So what they would do is um, you'd first uh, take your eLife article um, and using a uh, the platform that Stencilla has built called Stencilla Hub, you'd be able to convert that into a R Markdown or Jupyter Notebook file, uh, file format, depending on your preference. Um, and then once you've got that file downloaded uh, to your local environment, you can then add uh, the code um, that generates the figure back into the places that they are in the paper. And then once uh, we call that an enriched uh, our Markdown or Jupyter Notebook. So once that, that enrichment is done, uh, you can upload it back onto Stencilla Hub um, and add, uh, add any necessary data files for that code to be able to run. And then you create a snapshot um, and share that link with the eLife production team and we'll get that published. So quite simple really, and I'll show you how simple it really is um, now. So uh, let me just do a new share to show you how Stencilla Hub looks like um, when you first go to the website. Uh, not quite sure if I'm sharing the right thing. Yes, uh, so I've, I've gone incognito so that I can show you um, how it looks if you go to hub.sensor.lab. Um, there's a button to sign up for an account. So if you sign, the first thing you need to do is to sign up for an account basically. And then, so once you've done that, um, just toggling back to the other browser window where I'm logged in, um, you'll be able to see this project dashboard. Uh, so what you would want to do is to add a new project. So uh, I'm gonna create a demo project for today. So just opening that in the eLife account, uh, let's call it demo September 9, uh, create project. So that's your brand new project in the space where your, all your files, your markdown files, et cetera, will go. So um, for this demo, I'm gonna be using uh, an article that is already published on the eLife website. So assuming that I'm the author of this article here, um, so you can see normal eLife article, it's quite simple actually. Uh, it's got two figures. Um, figure two is the one that I want to make executable. It's one that you know, is generated by uh, some R code uh, that I found in the uh, GitHub repo associated with the research article. But if I'm the author, then I would have access to the code anyway. So um, first we need to take note of the uh, article number here. Um, so this one is 43154. So going back to the Hub, the first thing I need to do is to link this article to source. So go to sources. Um, as it describes here, sources are remote files that you can link to your project. So I'm creating a new source. Uh, there's very option, various options that Sincilla is working on providing, but um, for this particular launch, uh, we fo they focused on um, allowing linking from eLife articles. So again, we need that article number and then a path that the source is mapped 
to in the project. So let's say I call it paper, creating the source. So it's now pulling, Stencilla Hub is pulling the article uh, information into uh, the folder. And if I go back to files, I'd be able to see the uh, paper.xml. It's an XML file because eLife stores article in an XML format. Um, so next, uh, if you remember the workflow that I described before, I'll be converting this XML file into, uh, in this case, an R Markdown file because that's what the code was originally written in. So um, to do that, just hover over here on the right, um, three dot button has convert to, um, and then you can select, there's a wide range of options here as, as um, Spencer is working on a lot of these uh, different sort of conversion between the formats. Um, but again, I need an now mark down in this case. So hit that and I hit convert. Shouldn't take too long. All right, it's done. So if I just go back out to my file uh, directory, uh, you see that the paper.rmd has been uh, generated. And now I can just go ahead and download that into my local environment. So I'm going to switch over quickly to my RStudio uh, so you can see sort of the local part of this. So um, I've done this before, so, but you have to take my word that I can also show you the real one, but <laughs> this is the file that's been converted, uh, the R Markdown file. So uh, you can see that the metadata regarding the article has been very nicely preserved during the conversion. You can see that the author's uh, given name, family name, uh, all this metadata about various aspects of the author, the diff diff different authors as well. Um, and then uh, it's the title, it's a description of the uh, abstract. And then we go into the main text, the main text of the article. So the introduction. So as I explained, what I wanted to enrich or make executable is figure two, if you remember. Um, so I have to find figure two, which is here. Um, on line 288 on my screen here. So first I need to tell Stencilla that this is no longer a static figure, but a executable code chunk. So to do that, I will change this figure into a chunk. And then that's a link to the original um, image, static image of the figure. So I'll go ahead and remove that. We don't need it anymore. This is the title of the figure caption. So I'll keep that and that's the caption itself. And then here is where I'll be putting in my code chunk. So as I said, I've got the, I've went to the GitHub repo of the um, paper and I've looked at their code and, and figure out the bits that are uh, useful for the, the paper and sorry, the figure. And so, um, so here, if I insert the chunk, um, it's actually, I've already sort of pre-done that because it takes a bit of time. So this is, this is exactly the same file with the chunk copied in. So um, I've also run that ahead of time to show you that this is, the, this is the graph that was in the original paper. So I've put in the chunk. I'm happy with the you know, enrichment. I'll go ahead and save this. And then I will head back to Stencilla Hub to upload this. So let me press new, uh, upload. Choosing the file from my local environment. This is it, I think. So that's actually another source to the, the project. But um, as you can see, if I go back to files, I now have the 
enriched RMD version in the um, in the folder. Next thing I need to do is to make that the main file of the project so that um, when we create a snapshot, it will know that that's sort of the index page of, of the article itself. So I've just done that by using this. Uh, there was an option here to make the main file. I hope you saw that. <laughs> should have explained it. Um, any case, this is now the main file. So I'll go ahead and create a snapshot using this snapshot button over here. Now creating a snapshot. Takes a while. <laughs> All right. So um, let me just open that a bit bigger. And I'm going to go ahead and do one thing in advance so it could be a bit faster. But I'm going to click this uh, run document button on the top left. This actually starts the um, compute session that is needed to run the uh, executable figures. So you could see this is the executable uh, snapshot that I just generated. And this was the original article. It looks really, really sort of similar in terms of style. Um, you see the nice metadata being preserved. The authors are still in the same place. The, affili the affiliation is also in the same sort of location of the article. Um, of the page and see the abstract introduction um, and the original figure. Uh, figure one, which I didn't enrich. Figure two is the one that I put in the code. So this is the code chunk. Um, again, with this I button um, icon, I'll be able to click that and see the code that is underlying the uh, graphs and the graphs just came up as well. So because I clicked run document before it automatically starts running all of this code. And so um, the output is generated. And uh, yeah, I hope you can see that, you know, this is exactly um, what you saw. Uh, we still need to make some sort of stylistic er amendments as to, you know, how this uh, is displayed. There's sort of still some minor issues that need to be ironed out, but roughly we should end here. This looks basically um, the same as the published figure here. Um, and the nice thing about that again is that, so potentially this is actually a simulation paper. So uh, some of the parameters are here. So you can imagine that you could change that in the browser. I don't know what this is. I don't know what it does. <laughs> um, so you could run that again and the graph should, should be, uh, should change because of the changes that you've made. So, um, the other thing that I wanted to do is to show you a bit of the sort of metadata behind the semantic structure behind the, this page. So uh, here I'm using the uh, structured data testing tool from Google. Um, so if I just copy this over, I hope this works. This is a new thing that I'm trying. <laughs> Run the test on this. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, so this gives you a sort of nice, this tool gives you a nice overview of, sort of the structure of this, of this page. Um, and you'll be able to see in the article section that, again, it's that metadata that, that's been conserved, uh, even through the conversions from XML to R Markdown and then back to XML. So, um, that's all thanks to the fabulous work of uh, the Stencilla team into their tool called Encoder, which um, Alex will explain a bit more later. But um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my bit. Um, thanks for someone, I see that someone's posted the link to the demo, uh, so to the dummy article in the um, chat already, but the this is our sort of launch uh, um, post, blog post. So if you head to this link, um, there's actually two articles that we published. One is the one that I've shown uh, earlier, and there's another one by um, the team from Matt Nolan's uh, group um, from the University of Edinburgh. And they've also uh, uh, done a fabulous job at publishing a executable version of their research article. So do head over to this website to have a look and play around with the executable elements of both of these papers.
um, now pass to Alex. Thanks for the demo, Amy. That was really great. Um, so as Emmy mentioned, I'll be going over some of the technical aspects of, you know, how we, uh, of the methods we, we took to get the era working. And um, for us, the, the goal of this whole you know, project was to uh, reduce the burden on authors to uh, publish discoverable content, and then also to empower the readers to reuse the latest research for their own work and just reduce the friction for those two steps as much as possible. And to do that, we created uh, two projects. Uh, one is a schema, and uh, in uh, partner uh, in collab in, in its conjunction with that, so we have another project called Encoda. And what the uh, schema does is it builds on existing uh, open standards such as schema.org, microdata, JSON LD, and so forth. And uh, it allows us to capture all the semantic information about. Uh, manuscripts especially. Uh, it, it can cover uh, you know, any other um, topic um, that's needed, but we've been focusing primarily on research manuscripts. And you saw uh, when Amy took the article through to the Google structure, the data testing tool, sorry, um, that you, know, you can see all that uh, information being laid out about the authors, about the publication volumes, the issue numbers, and so forth. And this allows us to capture the, the, the data that's needed to represent that in a machine readable way. And because we have this in a standardized um, schema, then we can use Encoda to convert back and forth between the file formats. So going from the JAX XML to R Markdown to HTML, we are able to preserve all that information uh, in a structured and semantic way. And we, we try our best to preserve as much information as possible, but uh, we don't uh, attempt to capture all of the, the, the information that exists in the document. So for example, if you were to take um, either an HTML document or a Word document and you um, convert it, we won't preserve things like um, you know, font families or colors or um, some of the more stylistic attributes. And, um, and as Amy showed, going from an R markdown that's on the left, for example, to the right, we encode um, a lot of the, the semantic information using the microdata um, data attributes uh, or microdata attributes on the HTML elements, um, such as the, the item type, which is conforms to the schema.org article schema. We have things like the person who is an author and so forth. And what um, then this, these elements allow us to do is that they allowed us to develop uh, native web components to render some of those uh, schema um, components into HTML and rich interactive um, user interfaces. And these are, uh, we're, we've been building them in a future, as, as future looking and um, future proof and open and accessible method that we can in that the, 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 the web components are just renderers for the schema nodes in the browser. And they're built for progressive enhancement in that even if the web components um, for some reason fail to render or they, um, you know, they, you know, I don't know, so at some point are deprecated or uh, they change, all the, the source code, the elements and things like that, they are, still present in the HTML document. Um, and the, the other aspect of it is that the library of the schema uh, renderers or the, the web components, they're, they're designed to grow in number. And uh, we have, you know, like well, we, we've imagined uh, a point in time where uh, depending on the research domain, you could have a custom component for interacting with um, proteins or enzymes or any other kind of, you know, specialized um, uh, specialized uh, data that will help the reader uh, develop their intuition about the subject and get a better understanding and hopefully uh, spark more insights and, uh, you know, new ideas. Um, and to just, you know, make this example concrete, what schema does, uh, our Stencil Schema project does is it codes 
the, the elements into a JSON um, format. So for example, the code chunk, it has a, a type attribute, a programming language, text, and has many, many other uh, fields uh, to allow us to capture as much information as, uh, as we can. Um, and then this, um, this JSON here gets translated to HTML uh, for our custom web component. Um, and that looks something like this. It's, this is a bit of a simplified version, pardon me. But uh, you can see that we translate the, the type, the programming language, the code. And so even um, if we get rid of the visual representation or like, you know, the interface that Emmy showed with the little toggle for the source code and interactivity, you can still read the raw HTML and still be able to make sense of it and get a good idea of um, what the semantic information is there. And it means that the, the, the information is also present in the document in, um, uh, that is get, gets published. So these articles are, um, are much uh, better for organic discovery and things like search engine optimization. And Google uh, definitely is a big search engine, but others too, they, they look for the, the extra um, microdata attributes and they allow us, um, they, they, they're more easily searchable and indexable by these engines. So hopefully um, people looking for references and other you know, works to uh, build on top of can, can find them more easily and uh, with less effort. I guess that's, that's the, the goal. And uh, just to kind of wrap up a bit, um, HTML is just one of the, the formats. Uh, we support things like PDF, uh, Microsoft Word, the Google Docs, and uh, many, many more, as you saw in the dropdown that Amy showed. And the, everything we do at Stencil is open source. So um, we, can, we can keep uh, the supported format growing. And um, the, the key aspect for us is to always make sure that we can maintain the conversion uh, back and forth without losing the, the semantic information and the, the source content. So um, for example, converting from R Markdown to Word, which is traditionally not an executable format, we use something called um, reproducible PNGs. And what this allows us to do is we can encode the source code execute it, find the, you know, show the resulting output of a plot or some kind of figure. And we can encode the, the R code as a text chunk inside the PNG image and embed it into the document. So that way, when you go back to an R markdown, you can still, um, you still get back the, the, the R code um, into the, the newly, you know, converted document. And we found this uh, workflow to be uh, especially useful uh, based on some of our user interviews for uh, research students or people working uh, with, you know, either a research supervisor or a manager who, who needs to, or maybe even someone who's a slightly less technically um, uh, competent in that they, uh, they can collaborate on the copy or the text without having to have the technical know-how on how to get an R uh, project running and uh, re learning about markdown formats and so forth, they can make the text changes and then you can get back the Word document converted to R markdown, uh, preserving all those textual changes and you don't have to copy and paste, you know, like the differences in the text and that can be very error prone and um, not a pleasant experience. So um, I think that kind of sums up um, our our side of the things and some of the technical approaches that we've taken. And for everything, you know, uh, as I said, it's about compressing the time between doing the research and seeing the impact that this research leads to. And uh, we are very thankful for the eLife the support and um, the, the, you know, the, the, the future that ERA can lead to, hopefully. So thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, let me just share some of one last slide um, before we head. To, but you, please do start typing questions. I see some questions coming up already. So thank you. Uh, yeah, just leave with our sort of contacts. Um, 
we are, as I said, uh, hoping to update the community on our developments um, and we'd really like to uh, hear from all of you your feedback and uh, what you'd like to see in the future, for example. And um, so uh, to stay updated on the tool stack, we have a sort of bi-monthly-ish, so every two months um, newsletter that you can sign up for in this link here. Um, uh, yeah, uh, both Alex and my, my own um, contact details are here on the slide, so please feel free to reach out to us um, if you have any ideas or questions. So um, stop sharing. Um, Jeremy, I'm wondering if you want to feed the questions to us or if we just answer them as we see them coming up in the chat. Um, yeah, um, I'm happy to do, to do either way. Thank you. Thank you very much, both you, Emmy, and Alex, for, for a really interesting talk and a really great demo of, of the system. Um, yeah, I, I think I mean, if, you, if you'd like to, to take questions straight out the, the chat, then uh, please do, do go ahead. Um, and if other people, oh, sorry, my slides are going on. If other people have got questions uh, that they want to ask, either you can type them into the chat or if you want to ask them in person, that's also fine. Um, if you want to start off by, by going for the questions that are in the chat, then please do. Um, let me just get the, I've got too many windows and I'm going to go back to the chat. Um, yeah, but there are several questions there. So do, do feel free to, to go ahead and, uh, um, and take the questions from the chat. Uh, sure. So I'm, I'm going to go sort of time wise from top to bottom, I guess. <laughs> uh, so first we have Christine's question. What is with equations using equations now right down often LaTeX, LaTeX and then PANDOC translation of equation into word is often poor. Um, Alex, do you want to have a go with sure. equations? Yeah, so um, for, for equations, we take the same approach as for code chunks in that um, we translate, uh, we, we have a LaTeX renderer, so we convert them into an image and we insert it into the Word document. Um, and that, that image does also have the embedded LaTeX equation inside it so that when you go back, you can uh, get it back. So um, we found that to be a, a good and accurate representation uh, for the workflow. Uh, it does have some friction points around editing the equation inside Word. So that's kind of like the caveat there. Um, Thanks. I can, yeah. yeah, you can. I think the next <laughs> one, yeah. <laughs> From next Danny's you, I think. Yours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so how does uh, this compare to Pandoc? So that's a really great question. Uh, we actually do use Pandoc where it makes sense. So we, we try to avoid reinventing the wheel, as Amy said, where possible. And um, for example, for some of the, the file formats, we, we pass, um, we hand off the conversion uh, aspect to Pandoc. But in other cases, we either have to um, layer on top of the, the output of Pandoc gives, or in some cases we, for like, for example, JATS is, is one format that we found the Pandoc conversion a bit lacking uh, for, for our use case. So we, we have the option of using either the Pandoc JATS converter or our own custom one. So um, I think it's very much complementary. But uh, the aspects of that I think are truly unique for our uh, encoder and the conversion that we do is the the, the extra steps we do to maintain the, the, the bi-directional conversion for the reproducible elements, such as the code chunks and uh, the equations. I uh, hope that answers the question, but uh, feel free to ask if, if you like me to expand on that. Otherwise, I'll move on to Danny's question about how does this compare, uh, sorry, uh, Simon's uh, question, sorry, about how does it compare to uh, with the next journal? And that's a, that's a very good question. And in, in that next journal, I think, is uh, very similar, uh, is in a very similar space to us. And they offer a lot of the same things. Um, I think for us, it's, um, it's, it's, I think it really depends on use case. For us, we see the workflow and the integration with the publishers, the, some of the, the open uh, initiatives about the, uh, this, you know, like the, the, metadata that we embed into the generated documents and um, the open aspects of, of all the, the ecosystem that we're building as the differentiator. But I think it's, it's, it's very similar. So it's, uh, um, 
I think it, it comes down to the use cases and what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I guess I can try and have a go at the next one. Uh, ben asks, is there a particular file format that you would consider an ER format? Um, so a couple of ways to answer this. Um, eLife publishes XML, so uh, ultimately whatever file format you used, we'd have to find a way to convert that to XML. That has been true um, since the beginning of existence of journals, I believe. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, when you're submitting your Word or PDF um, um, manuscript, actually one of the most sort of painful jobs that we have to do is to convert that into an XML file. <laughs> um, uh, and with with era i think the the advantage is that um you know we now uh at this point we're now confident that uh our markdown in python would work so they could be the xml files uh as i showed could be converted into our markdown and or jupyter um, and then converted back without a problem um although that's also why we really want all of more of our authors to try this out so that we can um have more sort of experience and sort of get more uh we'd be able to friction uh lock a lot more of those uh different um articles and how they can be composed into an error um in the future i guess uh since it is working on you know and coda basically uh, caters for a lot of different file formats so anything that's possible there could be converted into the xml would be an era format ultimately in the future Please correct me if I'm wrong, Alex. <laughs> but I believe that's the vision. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. So I think at the moment when we're at this sort of just starting phase, where we're looking at uh, our markdown and 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 Jupyter, uh, Python, um, uh, from from our authors, and also in terms of data, tabular data, CSV, TSV, etc. But um, but yeah, in the future, you know, there's a lot. Theoretically, there's many many more possibilities, and uh, we'd love to explore those. Um, and then uh, next question from Danny as well. Uh, at this stage, they are accompanying objects. Should folks cite both the original and the era separately? Um, I'd say at the moment, yeah, the only the original version has a DOI, so I we recommend citing the original version uh but again that's something that we uh with Spencilla is our we're also interested in exploring to see how um that could work um alex do you want to expand on the sort of doi aspects of, of the narrow article yeah, sure so um i think for us the the doi aspect i think we're right now it's something that we're looking into what we envision, hopefully, is that uh, you saw Emmy click the snapshot button on the Stencilla project. And what that does is it pulls down all the remote sources, so the eLife chats, um, the, the, any other external files that you might have linked to the project, and it stores them inside uh, an immutable archive that, uh, that is you know, a fixed point in time version of all those files. Um, and um, it's providing a DOI on that collection, collective of, a collection of files, uh, including the R markdown that, that, you, that you've that you enriched is, uh, is something that we're interested in, but it's, uh, it's not there just yet. But hopefully it's something we can provide in the near future. Great, thanks, Alex. I think the next one's also yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, uh, Danny also asked, uh, I noticed that since the one could work to Jets, are the uh, eLife files not already in chats? So that is, those are both true, that we do kind of, uh, support converting to chats and the eLife files are in chats. What Emmy uh, did was when she provided the eLife article ID, the Stencilla um, uh, hub, it went out and it pulled down the, the chats files from the, uh, from the, uh, from the eLife GitHub uh, repository and pulled them into the, the local sources um, inside the Stencilla hub. So at that stage, we didn't actually convert anything. We just pulled them in, into the project. Uh, I hope that clarifies it a bit. Um, just gonna, just gonna uh, step in and say, I think we'll, we'll take one more question 
Um, we've got loads of loads of questions still coming up there. Um, what I think we'll then do is break for break out into into breakouts. But if people still want to continue chatting and asking questions, there'll be an opportunity to to do that. So um, I think if we if we just take um, one last question from Simon, who's asking what languages are supported? Does it support Julia? Sure. Um, right now, we, we've been focusing on R and Python. Uh, we do have early support uh, for Bash, and mainly for debugging purposes, and JavaScript. Um, but in theory, uh, everything is, as we said, it's uh, open and extensible. And uh, support for other languages is definitely a possibility. And uh, yeah, we like to do a support as many as needed by the community. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just going to say thank you again to, to both of you for uh, an excellent uh, presentation and, and demo. It's really interesting. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, who's attended. Um, I hope you found it uh, found it interesting. Um, we've we're very slightly over time, but we've got a little bit of time for for some some networking. So in a minute, what we'll do is we'll break off into into breakout groups. Um, but as I say, if you want to stay in the main call, you're welcome to 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 drop out the group, come back into the main call if you still have questions for the speakers. Um, and just to to highlight once again the source website uh, where you can find all the upcoming events and the source news mailing list, which you're welcome to join if you want to get um, emails with updates of the upcoming events and uh, what, what, what we've got on over the coming months. Um, and our next event will be on Wednesday, the 16th of September. So that's next week, um, 1800 UTC um, on research software directories. So I hope uh, many of you will be able to, to join that. So I thank the speakers again, and uh, we, will, we will wrap up the, the, the main part of the uh, session now. Thank you very much.